thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here again. So I really appreciate that. Uh, we, today we're going to talk about Python on Windows, which probably seems kind of weird because, I mean, what's the problem with Python on Windows, right? We've been doing Python on Windows for so many years, but the things are changing rapidly, and I thought it, was, it, was, um, it would be a good idea to look at the state of Python today on Windows. How many of you are on Windows on their daily Python coding job? So, a few of you. Okay, great, nice. And how many of you uh, use uh, um, the code editor on Windows, uh, for example? Or, uh, okay, or uh, what do you use? An IDE, probably, like Visual Studio or PyCharm or something like that to write code, Python code? Even if you are on Linux, right? All right. So the goals, the goals of this talk, are, I have three main tools, quite ambitious ones, probably. First one is raise the awareness of uh, the relevance of, of Python on Windows, on the Windows ecosystem. Second one is make sure that your code just work on Windows, on modern Windows. And third one, the wonders of Python development on Windows. I'm not kidding about the wonders about this one, and we, as we will see. Hopefully, I, I will have the time to show you a few things, uh, do some live demo. Hopefully, it won't blow up on my face, but I'm going to try. So let's start with some data. These uh, uh, slides are actually not my doing. They are from uh, Steve Dower, who had a talk at PyCon last May. In uh, I believe it was in Ohio, in Cleveland or something. And um, he has some data to share with you. And I asked for, for permission. He gave it to me. So here you see the PyPy downloads by operating system. Uh, um, and uh, the source, again, is PyPy. Now, Steve, probably because he is a core developer for Python, has uh, some insight uh, view on the data. Because uh, at least if I go on PyPy and look uh, at the packages, I don't get the download data. But he does get uh, the access to this data. So here they are. And here we can see that while uh, the majority of um, downloads uh, yes, are from Linux, we have a significant portion of downloads from Mac OS and Windows. What uh, is interesting here, in my opinion, is that uh, the Windows and the Mac OS slices are almost the same. While uh, probably, at least in my perception, I've been using a Mac for like 15 years uh, for, for writing Python. I really didn't have this uh, perception until I look at this uh, uh, graph here. Then we have the Conda downloads by operating systems. And things are starting to change. As you see here, Windows is a bit more relevant. We have more people probably using Conda on Windows than on Mac OS. Makes sense if you think about it, because Windows people probably are, are more used to curated um, selection of packages, etc. I'm not sure, but it is interesting nonetheless. And then we have this uh, survey that uh, the PSF ran uh, two years ago, so, so still uh, up to date or kind of up to date. And uh, here we see that 50% of the people who answered to the survey are actually on Windows. The missing data is probably people uh, using, I don't know, Android or other kind of uh, devices uh, uh, to write Python code or stuff like that. And this is a Microsoft data, actually. And uh, here we see that uh, apparently about 50% of the people using the Visual Studio Code editor are on Windows. This is really surprising to me, because everywhere I go at every conference, I see people using code. Code is probably one of the biggest Trojan horses in Microsoft powerhouse to let people uh, uh, like Microsoft again, right? So everybody's using code every day. Uh, nowadays, uh, in Python space probably, but also in JavaScript space, uh, and even uh, in C Sharp and uh, .NET space from where I come. But still, the majority of people are using code on Windows. And this is JetBrains uh, data, actually. Uh, PyCharm users, a huge portion of them are on uh, um, Windows. And finally, we have the downloads by operating systems uh, or python.org. Now here, uh, this um, 
chart is kind of skewed in my opinion because of course most of the people on Linux and the Mac are installing Python in different ways. They don't go to the website and download the, Poit the Python installer. They use uh, Homebrew on Mac and probably apt-get or whatever they use on their distribution. But still the important data here is that there are 29 million uh, downloads on the website and of these 24 million are on Windows. So what this tells us, tells us is that there is a huge uh, a user base on Windows. And because we are, uh, I mean, this probably, again, it, this is a steep double graph. <laughs> this is the Python user base according to the data. We have a lot of people on Windows, a lot of people on Linux, a lot of people on macOS. But most of the time, when you go to conferences, you speak to people, what uh, you perceive of the Python user space is this. Maybe I'm wrong, but my uh, opinion, my impression is that uh, uh, we tend to look at the Python, uh, especially at the Python developer community, like something that mostly sits comfortably in the Linux, Mac OS um, ecosystem. Do you agree with me? Do you have this impression as well when you uh, go and meet people and talk to people? You do, right. But as Steve said in his talk, uh, the libraries we write as developers are the welcome for, the, for most of the people using Python. So e whether they are end users of our applications we write on Python or they are developers themselves who are using our libraries, uh, the, um, yes, the Python itself uh, is uh, crossing uh, OS boundaries very well. There are no issues with Python, the language itself. It is cross-platform. It, uh, it, it has always been cross-platform. Where I see a problem, we see a problem, is um, in the libraries. Uh, there are many libraries online. Uh, you, you go on their websites, uh, you find instruction on how to install on Linux. Maybe on Mac, sometimes you find instruction on, on uh, how to install on Windows. We should make sure, because the user base is so huge, we, we should make sure that our code runs on Windows as well, because there is a, a huge user base waiting for uh, us and for our libraries. So here is a checklist uh, about what we should do to make sure that our uh, software runs on Windows. First, there is an assumption that everybody does on Linux and that, that everybody is on path. Everything, sorry, is on path, right? So you write Python on your shell and Python comes up. That's because of how uh, the paths work on POSIX systems. There is this hierarchy of uh, user space, uh, system space, etc. You are pretty much guaranteed that on Python, uh, uh, sorry, on Linux, uh, Python will just work. That's not always the case on Windows. Historically, we had, uh, we, I mean, we just saw the graph. A lot of people still go to the website to download Python. And when they get uh, something from, a, from an, I don't know, a library from a GitHub, for example, maybe they have issues following the instructions on the website of the library because they don't have Python 3 installed, for example. Or if they write Python, it will start Python 2 and not Python 3. Many libraries have, uh, like, uh, just write Python 3, name of the module but Python 3 won't work on, on Windows because the default is Python. And also on Windows, there is a pi.exe program they put in there just to make sure that uh, if you use pi.exe, it will launch the right version of Python depending on the module you're using. There are some differences. One option that you have is make sure that your module or library can run with python-m. This, this has been avail available for a long time, and what it does is l launch the interpreter and load the, your module and launch it from the interpreter itself. If your module runs with dash m, it will run on every operating system with no problem. So my advice is go make some w the work necessary to make sure that your module works with Python-M because it will be guaranteed to work across platforms. And then the paths themselves, as you probably know, yes, 
we all use forward slashes on Linux, but on Windows, for some weird reason, they use backward slashes. By the way, if you are a Windows guy, you're probably saying, okay, on Windows we use backward, sla backward slashes. For some weird reason, people on Linux use forward, sl forward slashes. So. But there is a very nice library in the, uh, in the Python uh, um, libraries, uh, in the in Python store, standard library, sorry, and it's Pathlib. You just go and use Pathlib when you want to, for example, combine several folders into a path. Don't go and hard core your path string into your program. Now, this might seem naive, something you have always been doing, but I can assure you in, in more than 25 years writing code, I've seen countless of programs crash on Windows or other systems just because people have been hard coding paths in their code. Yes, I will fix it. Right now, I, I only want to see if it works. Then you forget that hardcore path in your code. And when uh, somebody on Windows tries to use it, it will just explode in, in their face. So use Pathlib. It is super powerful. Works across boundaries very well. And then uh, where do you store configuration data for your app? User settings, uh, caching. Where do you do caching for your application when you are thinking about cross-platform again. POSIX systems and Windows systems have d take totally different approaches here. On Windows, you have the system directory, you have the app data directory, um, you have the application itself who is storing data probably within the application folder, etc. On POSIX, we tend to use the home folder for the user Usually, then we maybe make a hidden folder where we store our stuff like Git does. Um, um, almost everybody does, basically, on Linux. But there is this very nice library you can get on PyPy. It's called AppDears. And what it does is make sure that if you use this API, your data you are storing for your app or your user configuration will work across platform, will store your application data on the right directory respecting the use of the, of the operating system without you having to worry about it, about it. It is opinionated. There are th some things that probably someone else would do in a slightly different way, but it just works and it works very nicely. So my strong advice is uh, give a look at AppDears and use it. It is open source, so you can find the source on GitHub, so you can contribute to it if you want to. And how do you encode text in your app? This is a big issue in, uh, in, uh, when you are going to cross boundaries between operating systems, because everything is UTF-8, right? False. That's not true, because uh, you, you might not know that Windows 1.0 was released back in uh, 1985, I think. Um, and then uh, only in 1996, we had uh, Unicode 2 and the UTF-8 um, um, was released. So basically, Windows predates both uh, uh, predates, uh, Unicode and uh, it has been using a totally different encoding system for most of its lifespan. And for compatibility reason, reasons, new versions of uh, Windows have been uh, keeping backward compatibility with uh, um, the Windows encoding. So the advice, the general advice, is just use the STR module in Windows, which is uh, crossing, again, op uh, operating system boundaries without any issue. If you have to store some data, store uh, st some uh, uh, text, store it as STR or some bytes. And then uh, make sure that you um, do your own I.O. string conversions. And finally, even if you're doing all this stuff, you should still make sure that your module runs on Windows. And the best uh, way to do that is uh, use your uh, continuous integration infrastructure. Make sure that you use, you use some CI uh, service which has support for multiple operating systems, uh, for example, Upvayor and Azure pipelines uh, and many others nowadays support both Linux, Windows, Mac OS, so you can run 
your uh, tests not only on Linux but also on Windows, also on Mac. You will find that there are issues. Myself, as an open source developer, I have a few open source projects that uh, have been quite successful. And um, at the beginning, several years ago, we had issues with Windows, just because we weren't testing on Windows. And people, luckily for us, came to the website, uh, to, to GitHub, opened a ticket, submitted a pull request, and fixed it for us. But nowadays, I'm, try I'm moving all my open source projects to Azure pipelines, for example, just because I want to make sure that everything works smoothly on Windows, too. Precisely because there are 24 million possible users for my uh, packages. And there are other options that we will be looking at in the following minutes. By the way, this is the link to the Steve Dowers talk at PyCon US. If you want more details on this checklist, his talk is all about this, uh, um, this checklist, basically. <laughs> and so I really suggest you strongly, uh, advise you to go and look at this uh, talk if you are interested. All right, Python development on Windows. Last year, tooling around Python on Windows has been rapidly evolving. Uh, for several reasons, the main reasons, in my opinion, main reason, in my opinion, is that Microsoft has been hiring some super smart guys. Several Python core developers are now Microsoft employees. Steve Dower is one of them. There is Brett Cannon as well, and a few others. I don't remember the name right now. So we have people work who have been working at the Python core for a long time. And they are now Microsoft employees, and they are working on Python on Windows. And it shows. We will see. Uh, one big, huge new is uh, the one-click install from the Microsoft Store. Uh, you don't have or you will not need to go on python.org to download my, uh, Python anymore because Windows 10 in the latest releases on the fast ring um, of the Windows Pre Insider program uh, now allows you to install from the Microsoft Store just with one click. We will see a screenshot later on. Visual Studio for a while has been having a great support for Python support. So you can write your C sharp, your F sharp, or whatever code is C++ code in Visual Studio. And now you can also write a great Python uh, code on Visual Studio. Code and the Python extension, they work on Linux, of course. They work on Mac, but they also work seamlessly on uh, Windows. So you can use that. But there are a few nice new toys. One is the new Windows Terminal, and the other one is the Windows Assistant for Linux, version 2. We will give a look at these last two, because I find them to be extremely exciting today, especially for people like me who, who have been working on Linux for such a long time. So one click install. Here we see Scott, Scott Hanselman, who, I mean, this is the obligatory screenshot from Scott Hanselman. He has been typing Python in the command prompt on Windows. And what happened is that Python is not installed on this system. And the, the Microsoft Store comes up and offers to install Python right away. You just have to click install, and you get Python, Python 2, and Python 3 installed on your system. This is very nice. Makes uh, the um, you know the, uh, the very easy, frictionless to have Python on your Windows machine. We still don't have Python coming with the operating system like we are used to do with uh, Linux and macOS. By the way, they are, I believe they are removing Python for macOS from Catalina. It's not a default installer. I'm not really 100% sure, but I think they are removing Python and, and other script languages like Ruby from the official distribution. Anyway, super nice. Visual Studio again. If I were at a .NET conference, I, w I would now go and show you how you can leverage uh, um, Visual Studio to write Python code. 
here I will just mention that you have all the stuff you are used to when working in a powerful IDE like Visual Studio is. So you, you have package management, virtual environment support, intelligence and code analysis, which means basically um, code completion and the suggestions about how to improve your code quality. Interactive debugging, uh, unit testing, templates for the major frameworks, etc. It works just as you would expect. PyCharm, of course, is, is um, also a very nice option. Both are free. Uh, Visual Studio, not many know that uh, the community edition of Visual Studio is totally free and works uh, like a charm, like, uh, I mean, it works like the Enterprise Edition. You just have a, a very few minor, in my opinion, uh, feature on the, on the Enterprise Edition, but you can get uh, the community edition for free. And the Windows Terminal, this is, in my opinion, very nice. It is something totally new. I don't know if you have seen it already. Um, it is basically a replacement for the common prompt, the legacy uh, command line interface we have on Windows. We have been having the common prompt for like uh, 25 or maybe 30 years. And it was really, really due for an improvement, for a new version. And we now have this Windows terminal. It has a number of features, multiple tabs, it supports the common prompt, but also PowerShell and Linux. GPU accelerated test rendering, emojis, ideograms, symbols, icons, ligatures, you name it. Links, you have a link in your command line, you can click on it and your browser will go there. How surprising, we didn't have that on a common prompt. Um, it is configurable and customizable via JSON file. It is very nice. M support for multiple profiles. It has a brand new font, Cascadia font, which supports ligatures. And uh, all of this is open source, so you can go on, um, click on that link, and you go on GitHub, and you can contribute to the preview. There is a very nice video on, um, uh, on YouTube about the Windows Terminal. We will give a look at the Windows Terminal in a few minutes. And the Windows Assistant for Linux. How many of you have been playing with it? No one. Nice. Not so nice, but I'm happy because I have something interesting to show you. <laughs> so here, what we're seeing is an animation of a guy on Windows, as you see. You can tell <laughs> from the toolbar, probably. This guy is using Ubuntu here. OK, he clicks on Ubuntu, a uh, shell opens. He, he is launching a Docker container here, and then he is going into the container on the, on the bash, ash, and checking that we indeed are on Alpine. All of this in uh, 20 seconds. The guy is not a super fast typer, in my opinion. You can get better performance, <laughs> but it's still impressive because we are looking at Windows running Ubuntu at nearly native speed. Some facts about the Windows Assistant for Linux. What it does is basically run F64 binaries, Linux binaries on Windows. Windows itself ships with a Linux kernel the kernel is open source, of course, and Microsoft is contributing up, upstream to the Linux kernel. So here, you can see that, you can tell this is a Windows, uh, a customized kernel, because when, here I am installing Ubuntu, basically. I'm just done installing it, and it, it is asking for my, my username. And you can see there, the username does not need to match your Windows username. This is something that you don't get on Ubuntu. But here you get it because you are running inside Windows and it is telling you, look, you can create a totally different user here. You don't have to match the Windows user you have on your operating system, which is running in the background. <clears throat> so uh, let me uh, allow me to stress this. Microsoft is uh, running a Linux kernel 
with Windows and it is contributing upstream to the Linux kernel itself. They have been contributing several patches to the Linux kernel in the last years or so. I believe this is quite relevant, something 10 years ago we nobody here would have dreamed about, right? So how does it work? Basically, it runs a lightweight utility virtual machine, which is something totally different from, I don't know, VirtualBox, VMware, or whatever you're already used to. This is something very small, very tiny, super fast boot time, very small footprint, zero configuration. You don't have to mess around with the virtual machine itself. It is run by Windows, so you don't have a, any need to mess with the machine itself, but you will find an experience that is like using Linux natively. Both the uh, Windows Assistant for Linux and the Linux kernels are, uh, Linux kernel are, are open source, so you can contribute to them. And you can one click install your favorite Linux distribution within Windows, not just Ubuntu, you also have uh, Debian, Kali Linux, OpenSUSE, etc. I believe you can also uh, work on your own custom distribution and have it run into, uh, into Windows, into the Windows Assistant for Linux. So you go on the store, you search for Debian, and you one click install Debian. The same you can do with all the other distributions. Which means that you can run side by side different distributions, for example, for testing purposes. Without having to use a virtual box uh, with the slowness, the slugginess uh, that uh, virtual machine normally carry with them. So let's try and play a little bit with uh, the win Windows terminal. <clears throat> okay. Just a second. All right. So here I am uh, on the new terminal. You can tell it we are not on a common prompt because I have tabs up here. I'm on the Ubuntu tab, but I can also switch to the common prompt here. And yeah, I don't know what I have here. I have Kali running here. So I'm on Ubuntu. Just to make sure that I'm on Ubuntu, let's. Uh, sorry. Need to fix the keyboard. Here we go. This is Ubuntu, Bionic Beaver, latest version. <clears throat> but because we are in Windows and we are running the Windows Assistant for Linux, what if I try to run a Windows application like Explorer? and I want to give a look at the current directory within my Linux system. Explorer dot. It just works. So now I have a nice looking IDE with the contents. If you look at the contents, this is our Linux directory. There I have all my hidden folders, configuration file, bash, etc. bash files, etc. If I click here, I can give a look at the path there is that strange uh, VSL dollar sign and then Ubuntu home Nicola. So I am on my own home directory. And that's how you go from Windows to uh, USL back and forth. You use WSL dollar to get to the Linux part of your uh, hard disk. But because we are on uh, Linux, we are Linux guys, we want to use Linux uh, the way we love to do. Why can't we use open dash? Actually, we can. We get Explorer opening instead of uh, uh, whatever we use on um, Linux. But this works just because I went uh, and created an alias. And I don't know if you can read it here. Like I would do as a Linux guy for uh, um, 
for my uh, for any alias I, I am used to do it on Linux everything just works by the way I am using as you can see here I'm not using bash I'm using uh, these as age you can use whatever you want everything works fish shell if you prefer let me see if I manage to flee right okay now we saw that we can launch uh, um, Windows app from Linux what about launching a Linux application from Windows here I am on the common prompt I opened a new tab and went on the good old common prompt I just need to write VSL uh, for example uh, fortune this is the output of the fortune command from Linux invoked from Windows I could do something like this oh. again output coming from Linux into a Windows application let me go back to you might wonder okay this is a nice toy but probably as soon as I, I want to do something more advanced it won't work I will have issues what about using SS Edge for example now I just connected to my digital ocean private instance without any problem I can use it without issues I can do even something different like for example um, let me see ah uh, yes let me go to the dev directory here we have one folder where I have a C program this hello dot C program is uh, your good old Kenny Garner Ritchie uh, C hello world actually no I had to add the int uh, the type of the main function otherwise the compiler will give me a warning because uh, it is not returning any type this is modern C for you guys but I can still go and compile hello.c as hello and then run it of course it works but what I really want to show you is that if I uh, what the syntax again oh, uh, thank you I don't have the right glasses so <laughs> it's not very easy for me it is an F64 binary of course I just compared it <laughs> within Linux uh, um, I mean I can just write code but let's look at something and compile code let's go at in the hello web directory this is more interesting in my opinion if I manage okay we have hello.pi now if I try to run Python hello it doesn't work because I don't have flask installed here but I can probably use a virtual environment like we are used to do yes I can work on I already installed here virtual and wrapper and so I have virtual env available I can just work on uh, hello web I, I believe okay you can see that now I'm within a, the virtual environment I can go and Python hello PI and I have a server running now this is interesting how do I make sure that it works it is running but how do I connect to this server since it is running within Linux well as you can imagine by now I can go on the Windows side lo use my standard browser go on localhost 5000 and it works 
So again, I can have my server and my development stack on Linux because I love working on Linux and with the Linux tool set, but I can still test my website or whatever I'm working on on the Windows side. <clears throat> okay. Mm, let me see if I have something else. Well, we already saw that we can have uh, Kali here. Oh, I didn't show you that. Um, here I'm on uh, um, right on my home directory in uh, Linux. But what about the Windows side of the hard disk? Can I access it from Bash or? Uh, ZSH, if I wanted to. Yes, I can, because all I have to do is uh, CD on uh, Oops. Oh, sorry. Right. So I must see now, if I ls, I see the Windows files, I'm getting some uh, permission error because I'm supposed to sudo if I want, because of privileges. Ooh, I'm... Right, now I can ls without any issue. So again, I can move across the file systems and use my bash skills on the Windows files if I really need to. I wouldn't really advise you to start moving stuff between Windows and Linux, but you can do that. Right? Now, since we are using the Windows terminal, let's look at another interesting option it offers us, and it's the settings. These are the terminal settings. As you can see, we have uh, different profiles here. We have a, a laser pointer. Mm, yes. Profiles. This is the Ubuntu profile. This is the common the prompt profile. You can see here that I'm telling Windows I want to use the Cascadia code font in my command prompt. I also want to use Cascadia code in my uh, Ubuntu session. I, I could have totally different fonts, configuration settings. For example, here I'm telling my starting directory must be my home directory on Ubuntu. While if we go back and look at the Kali uh, tab, I, we were on the C side on the, or the default directory for the Windows terminal. Sorry, for the Windows Assistant for Linux is the C directory, the user directory on the Windows side. But we can work, uh, and it is very nice because, for example, here I, I have the font size set at 12. If I change this value and I save, look at the window behind me. You see, it is immediately taking the, cha the, the change, taking, no taking note of the change and updating. At the same time, if I wanted to change the name of my distribution here in a Peter PI, for example, and then I save, when I go back to my terminal window, I have Peter PI here instead of Ubuntu. I can decide the, the, the order of these stuff, etc. Of these voices, uh, I can do whatever I want. The Windows Assistant for Linux is in preview right now. You have to be on the insider, you have to join the insider program if you want to get it on your system, and you have to be on the fast ring at that. There are some things that you have to set on your machine in order to have it working, like enable virtualization of the BIOS, a virtual machine platform feature must be active, active etc. 
but there is there is still one small problem with the uh, uh, Windows Assistant for Linux. So you don't have any uh, uh, um, graphical interface. We can't install at all a tool like the Visual Studio Code on Linux itself from Windows. But we do have interop, interop between the two systems. So what do we do here? Microsoft recommends that you do not alter files on the, win on the Linux side from Windows. The solution is the remote extension for code. Basically, this extension allows you to connect from the Windows side, from, from uh, code running on Windows, to connect to Linux and use the Linux uh, file system and run your application from Windows into Linux in, uh, somehow. I will try, if we have the time, to show you this because I find it to be super interesting. Let me, I'm on Windows, I launch code. If I try to open a file, it offers me the Explorer window on my Windows file system, but if I open a new remote VSL window, and that's possible because I have my remote extension installed. Ah, and this one, sorry. Now if I try to open a file, you see that I'm offered a different dialog and my default folder is my home folder on Linux. So I can go uh, go to the dev folder and open uh, this small app I have here. This is some code I wrote with my daughter a few years ago. Very simple uh, game, command line game. But what's interesting here is that I'm running code on Windows and I'm accessing a repository on the Linux side. And I have a terminal down there, which is a Linux terminal, as you can see by the prompt. If I try to launch this application, you will see, look at the, at the terminal below. It detects that we have a virtual environment, it activates the virtual environment, and then launches the application within the virtual environment. So what's your name? My name is Nicola. And now, because I have a breakpoint here, like I would do in Visual Studio or PyCharm or whatever, oops, I can, for example, you see that the program stopped here. So I'm debugging a Linux app from a, my uh, code editor. I can inspect the variables, etc. So because we are developers uh, between 1 and 20, 10. Wow, <laughs> I got it at the first try. I wanted to show you a binary access, but uh, no luck. I'm just too good at this game. OK. So um, what else? Let me see. Uh, of course, if you are a Linux guy, you probably want to stay on, on the Linux side of things. So you might say, mm, yes, it's OK, but I don't really want to. to go on Windows, open code there, etc. Let me deactivate. OK, I'm accessing this very same folder I was using from, Win I was using from Windows. So probably I would be here, and I would go code dot. Open code in this directory, which is what we usually do on Mac or on Linux. What we'll do, and we saw that earlier because we were launching Explorer, we'll open code on Windows. It will connect to the Windows system for Linux, and everything will just work. OK, let's go back to our slide because we are almost done.
by the way, the remote extension for code also work with SSH and with Docker, so you can do the same trick, uh, but uh, you, you might want to work and uh, write code uh, connected against a remote instance or a Docker container, not just with the Windows Assistant for Linux. So it is a super interesting extension, in my opinion. So basically, you can, with the Windows Assistant for Linux, you can run Windows and Linux by, side by side, and you can run m multiple versions of Linux side by side, which is very nice. Even if you are a Linux guy, you, you usually get VirtualBox and run Kali into VirtualBox. You don't need to do that. You can just switch from one tab to another in the Windows terminal. No heavyweight virtual machines. You can leverage your Unix skills, even if you are on Windows. But you also have all the powerful desktop applications. You have a Windows Office, for example. Or uh, the guy who is doing a talk on the, in the other room just showed me, you see that taskbar down below there. It is a perf graph, something to, to test network performance. He's, he was mentioning to me that he prefers staying on Windows just because of that utility, where he can uh, track network performance very well. But he is a Linux guy. So the, 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 the merging of these two uh, um, ecosystems, is, uh, for him, is, it is a super appealing games. But the, po the whole point is that all of my life I've been, I was forced to make a choice, either stay on the Linux side or stay on the Windows side. These two worlds are totally separated, right? There is kind of a wall in the middle. People, yeah, there are people who are using both, but like me, if you are like me, you are on a Mac and you're running Windows into a VirtualBox machine or VMware machine, slowness, slowness etc. This system opens, open up, I believe, for very interesting scenarios in the future. We can have uh, all the beauty and the usefulness and stability and we can leverage all our skills. We can use Linux as we are used to do. But we can, at the same time, be on Windows without the friction of using a heavyweight virtual machine. And this is something very innovative. Innovation, in my opinion, is happening right here, right now. This is something, but not only, not just 10 years ago, maybe five years ago, three years ago, I perso personally, I wouldn't even imagine that something like this would be possible, right? Some small issues, uh, probably part of the questions. So m maybe we can have the questions now because I'm basically done. So if there are questions here, there are some answers. Uh, if uh, the questions don't come up, we will give a look at them. Um, I wanted to say that I believe it's not so crowded here because everybody went to another talk to have a holy war about GraphQL. Ah, that's right. fine because you lot you have better chances to win we have a couple of gifts from our sponsors for the most interesting questions so we can proceed with the question part okay i was just curious in Maybe that one. Uh, yeah, that one's doing it. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure my question merits the, that. But anyway, uh, I was curious if there's a way to uh, configure the VM at all. I mean, you mentioned it's very lightweight, but what if I wanted to change the available memory, the number of uh, CPU cores that were exposed in the subsystem? So right now, you can't. There is zero configuration available to you right now, but they, I believe we can express something like that. For example, just yesterday, they released a new uh, version of the kernel and the, of the virtual machine, or I should say the, the, of the kernel and the Windows system for Linux, just to optimize memory usage. And they are not, they, there is now a new super nice option, which basically will uh, reclaim memory as it is not being used anymore in, the, in, the, in your Linux system. This is something that wasn't available until uh, two days ago. Basically, if you were using RAM into your virtual machine, it would, uh, it would keep uh, using RAM and not releasing it. 
starting effective today basically we now it is releasing um, it is releasing the memory it is using now that you mention it just uh, tonight I was reading the release uh, notes and there is the option to change the behavior of the virtual machine so my answer is probably is you can because just tonight <laughs> I saw that there is an option when you launch the system for to, to say how you want this virtual machine or reclaim option to be working so we can expect I mean this is oh by the way I didn't mention but Windows terminal is in preview mode Windows assistant for Linux is in preview mode everything here is in preview mode nothing of this is released right now again you you have to join the insider program to get the basically the beta release of Windows all right so this stuff is really ra rapidly evolving and for example just yesterday we had this patch I would expect for example that you will have more control over the virtual machine in fact you already do and um, also speaking of the terminal I expect a lot of very nice things coming out of the new terminal by the way, if you are used to using stuff like Tmux on the, or Tmux, depending on how you pronounce it, on Linux, it works within the Windows Assistant for Linux. But I would expect the terminal itself to become so powerful. So, for example, tiling uh, tabs, stuff like that, I expect it to be available in the terminal itself. Other questions? Yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have uh, some questions regarding the checklist of uh, making yeah. uh, making let me, your let me go uh, back uh, to the checklist. Yeah, work on Windows. Yeah, have you messed uh, with some problems porting maybe your libraries uh, or something? Yeah, I did actually. Uh, back in, in the day, let me find the checklist because I find it to be super important. Yeah. Again, first of all go and look at Steve Dower's talk which is much better than mine <laughs> uh, basically because first of all because he's a native uh, English speaker that helps but also because he's a Python core developer and he's actually working on this stuff I'm just telling about it he is coding this stuff for example the uh, one click install of Python is uh, he's doing he is who did that Yes, we had the issues with uh, Eve. Uh, some of you might know Eve, my REST framework. It's been around for seven years now, so nothing new. Uh, and maybe even with Cerberus, we had uh, people opening tickets because they weren't, they, they couldn't run in it on uh, Eve. And back then, just because I was on Linux or macOS, I had issues solving that ticket because I didn't have a Windows at hand just to play with it. What saved me back then was uh, that somebody else on Windows found the issue and submitted a pull request. So everything was fine. But back then, I should also mention, we didn't have a CI option, a free CI option for open source project that would allow me to run w on Windows. I was using Travis. Actually, I believe Eva is still on Travis, but I plan on moving it, it to Azure pipelines just because I want to uh, CI on Windows as well. Uh, and is it Azure pipeline free or it's... Yes, they are free for open source projects yeah. and uh, they are very, very nice. I'm running some C sharp open source projects on Azure pipelines. I believe they are right now the best option for CI integration, especially so for open source projects. It is super fast especially compared to Travis and you can run your builds against Mac OS, Windows and Linux again so it is very nice um, I also want to mention speaking of make sure that Sham works or in, or in general I want to stress the importance of documenting how you run stuff on Windows because people get lost when they are Windows they go a super, on a super nice uh, package website and they try to use it on Windows it doesn't work I heard this happening so many times because I have so many people uh, working on Windows and in my company as well so it is very important that you test it but also document it if there is something different and usually there is something different in, in how you install a package uh, on the different systems okay thank you welcome and is there no much questions? I have just one small question about Cerberus. 
It's a very nice library. We are using it. Thank you very much for it. Uh, are you planning to add something? We, we have one thing we need from Cerberus. One more thing we need from Cerberus is uh, synchronous validation. Uh, not just uh, some, some async validator that need to go somewhere, get some data, and check that it's, uh, it's okay, valid. Okay, so you mean something like we have in EVE uh, webhooks, uh, I mean, um, not webhooks, but callbacks in a way that you can uh, go and uh, plug in your uh, own validator that goes uh, somewhere remote yeah, exactly. and makes a check. Yeah. Uh, I suspect that you can already do something like that because you can write your own validator and uh, yeah. validation rule, right? Am yeah, I right? We, we did some work around for that. <laughs> okay. But, uh, is that you want it to be more seamless uh, within? Yeah. yeah. So I uh, should mention that servers right now, just a few days ago, um, I I mean, I'm still on the servers project. I'm working on it, but I have a super cool maintainer right now. His nickname is uh, Funky Future. If you go on, uh, on GitHub, super nice nickname. And uh, he has been working on the latest uh, releases of Cerberus, and he's working on Cerberus uh, 2.ho. We just released a few days ago the Python 3.8 uh, the, um, official release. But in a few months, uh, you can expect a server servers 2 to be available and if you have a request like this one it is right now it is the right moment to go and open a ticket because funky is uh, really looking at uh, packaging the latest features and he can give you the, the right feedback on this feature as well he is there is already a pull request with the new design and the new API design with, which has been changes, changing quite a lot. I'm not really up to speed with the latest changes, so you might want to check it because maybe something like that is already available on the Chu API. Oh, that's nice thing. Right time to... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. The right, the perfect moment to go and ask, not, not really for, for Cerberus 1, but for Cerberus 2, which is I, I think we have it on the roadmap uh, to be released, maybe not this year because it, <laughs> we are almost at the end of the year, but very soon. So, okay, so thank I'm, you very much. You're thank welcome. You. All right, thank you, everybody. I'm in the hallway if you need me. Yeah, you still need thank to. You. Um, so, the about the questions. Of giving. Our sponsor. So guests. let me think about the questions. Hmm. I think David. <laughs> you, you have to choose who's getting a power bank and who's getting a mug. Oh. So David, which one would you like? <laughs> you take what? This is a power bank. So you want a mug, probably. Yeah, oh, great. So. I will give the mug to this guy here. It is my choice to give the mug to this guy. Okay. <laughs> okay. And the thanks, Nicola. Let's give a round of applause.